Good morning, Renewal. I'm glad that you're joining us this morning in our time of worship. My name is Dave Kim. I'm one of the pastors at Renewal, and I'll lead our time of worship. Here at Renewal, we begin with a call to worship where we recognize how it is God who calls us to worship him. We will do that through Psalm 130, where we get to see that hope and love and his salvation are all found only in God. And therefore, we long for him and we hope in him and we worship him. So I'll read the first part and you can respond. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who would stand? But with you there is forgiveness, and you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for all your goodness and mercy. We thank you for allowing us to worship you in your grace. We ask that our hearts will be focused on you as we praise you. Would you let your love be known to us this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now praise the Lord. worship our God, sing the song together, giving praise, seeing the grace that he provides us each and every day.
recognize God's grace is enough and that how his love covers us uh, we get to now see how we are how inadequate and imperfect we are so let us now come to him in confession today's corporate confession of sin comes from 1 John 3 16 to 18 so I'll read that for us by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Now let us pray this prayer together. God of heaven, take full possession of our hearts. For you have redeemed us where we were worthless and of no holy value. You purchased us, washed us, clothed us, and adorned us with every heavenly blessing in the highest places. Forgive us daily and even hourly for our obsession with ourselves and the select few we choose to love. Our compassion has dwindled to short-lived deeds and only passing words of sympathy. Turn our hearts from vanity and from dissatisfactions, from uncertainties of the present state to an eternal interest in Christ. Let us remember that life is short and unforeseen and is an opportunity for usefulness. Give us a holy resolve to redeem the time and to awake at every call to charity and piety so that we may feed the hungry, clothe the naked, forgive the offender, diffuse the gospel, and show neighborly love to all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let us spend some time coming to God in repentance. Let's come to God with a humble heart. What do we need to ask for forgiveness? What kind of obsessions have we shown uh, with ourselves? And how have we limited our love for one another? Let us have this time to reflect on all those things and bring him to God and ask for his forgiveness. Let's pray. wonderful Lord we have. We come to Jesus in repentance, and as we put our faith in him, we are considered righteous. And our iniquities do not define us anymore, but it is Christ who lives in us. And we start to walk in him and toward him. That's the assurance of the gospel pardon this morning from Titus 2. 
So hear this assurance. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now let's stand in affirmation of our faith together by reciting the Lausanne faith of a covenant of faith. We affirm our belief in the one eternal God, creator and Lord of the world, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who governs all things according to the purpose of his will. He has been calling out from the world a people for himself and sending them back into the world to be his servants and his witnesses for the extension of his kingdom, the building up of Christ's body, and the glory of his name. We confess with shame that we have often denied our calling and failed in our mission by becoming conformed to the world or by withdrawing from it. Yet we rejoice that even when born by earthen vessels, the gospel is still a precious treasure. To the task of making that treasure known in the power of the Holy Spirit, we desire to dedicate ourselves anew. Let's now go into a time of confession song.
Thank you so much that you came down and intervened, that you came down to die for our sin, and we pray that we would respond in worship and gratitude, and in this very tough season, that we'd be able to see the great love that you have for us. So um, help us to continue in our worship today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now at this time, our sister Esther will take us to a time of prayer for the nation of Maldives. Today we will be praying for the Maldives. These tiny islands in the Indian Ocean are known to many as holiday destinations, but its half million people are among the least evangelized on earth. Islam is the only permitted faith. Indigenous Christians are solitary and secret. The nation is troubled by political repression, upheaval, abuse, drug abuse, and divorce. Sadly, these are all very common. No place in the Maldives rises more than two meters above sea level, and most of its people work in the fishing industry. Few, if any other countries, are more exposed to the danger of a warming and expanding ocean. Please pray for the following prayer requests. While many people in the Maldives are prosperous, there are deep issues within society. For example, the Maldives has one of the highest divorce rates in the world. Child abuse and teenage drug abuse are also extremely high. Pray for healing and for renewal. The Maldivians are also among the least evangelized on earth since their government does not allow mission work or Christian literature. Maldivians interpret Western culture, media, and tourists as Christians, and therefore see Christians as immoral. Political opponents now use the word Christian to insult one another. Pray for this nation to know the true nature of Jesus. I invite you now to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up the islands of the Maldives to you. May these islands, though tiny, not go forgotten in your eyes. We know that you see and hear them and long to see them prosper in faith. We pray for the people of the Maldives that you would bring a rooted faith to them. We pray for the deep-seated brokenness that exists in their society, including high rates of divorce, teen drug abuse, and child abuse. Would you heal the political system so that upheaval would be kept at bay so that leadership who care for the people could rise up? We pray that one day the Maldives would not be known as the least evangelized country on earth, but as a place where faith abounds. We ask that you bring Christians to penetrate into leadership, that Christ believers would help share with the Maldivian people the ways of Christ. We pray that the Christian faith as one of following Jesus and not one of following Western immorality or commercialism. We pray that being Christian would not be a curse or a weapon, but rather a way to bring healing and love to a country that desperately needs you. We lift these prayers up to you on behalf of the Maldivian people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's go over some announcements. Welcome visitors. Um, if you're new to our church, we welcome you with the love of Christ. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so excited to worship with you, and we would like to meet you, so please visit our website and hear more about us and tell us more about you. And also after service, on our homepage, there's going to be a blue button that says Zoom Fellowship, where we join right after worship to have further fellowship, so please join us after worship. I'm sorry, I actually misspoke. Uh, we're going to have congregational meeting today. Uh, that is uh, my bad. Um, and tithes and offerings. There are two ways you could give tithes and offerings. If you're new, uh, please do not feel obligated to give, but um, we can do e-giving or mailing the checks to our mailbox. And when we do so, let us give with a prayerful heart, asking God for the right use of his resources for his ministry. 
And we do have congregational meeting today. Uh, we're asking for all of our formal members to join us uh, for this meeting today at 12 p.m. So if you're just attending, you're also welcome to join us and observe the meeting. And next, we have virtual monthly prayer meeting where we could, you could join us this coming Wednesday for our monthly prayer meetings as we pray for our church as well as the world around us. The Zoom link will be made available on our homepage, so I hope that all of us can come together in prayer. And now, uh, you could connect with fellow football fans in our church by participating in Fantasy Football League. In late August and early September, we will hold online drafts on Yahoo and Zoom, and you could register throughout our, uh, through our website by August 21st, uh, 23rd. And as always, for us, uh, if you're facing any kind of needs, uh, do not hesitate to contact us. We would love to pray for you and walk alongside you. Now that's it for the announcements. Let's now turn to our passage John uh, chapter 18, verse 33, to chapter 19, verse 16. Once again, the passage is John 18, 33 to 19, 16. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Uh, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself a son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took 
Jesus. Good morning, Renault and friends. Uh, we welcome you uh, as we continue to worship our Lord through his word. Uh, if you're still with us, uh, we thank you for your patience. Um, you probably might know by now if uh, there's something wrong with any other connection, uh, just simply refresh uh, our homepage and keep trying, and eventually it will be up and live. So we thank you for that. My name is Luke Wu. Uh, I am one of the pastors here, and I have the privilege of preaching the word for us this morning. Um, we just came back as a session from a retreat, a unique one where we were very socially distant, uh, but still very helpful and fruitful as we prayed uh, for our church, uh, praying over things like this, how we can continue to provide uh, a worship service in a way that's meaningful, in a way that is a uh, uh, feeding to our souls. So uh, we had a great time. We just ask all the church to continue to pray for us, the leaders, as we think about this fall and this semester as well. Uh, before we dive into the word, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for uh, God to speak to us through this passage. Uh, and also I want to pray uh, just for various needs and concerns uh, for our church. So won't you join with me as we pray together as we enter his word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you that your word continues to give us life. So as we look into your word, may we have that expectation that we will be given this bread of life. God, we pray that it will be a source of life for all of those listening, for those who are in need, who are suffering. We think of people like our dear brother and elder Joe and his family, pray that it will comfort them, that it will give them hope and give others hope who likewise need to hear a message of redemption, a message of life, and a message of love. We pray, Lord, that it will be a source of strength for those struggling with various issues around the country, especially those working in health care and schools, for administrators and teachers, that it will give them a source of strength and perseverance as well. We pray that all of us may hear your word and be forever changed by your gospel. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been going through various encounters with Jesus in the gospel of John. And we saw that Jesus deals with people in various, uh, very different ways. And it all depends on the situation that each person is in, depending where their heart is. He can be gentle or stern. And as we looked at various people, we're going to continue that with this encounter now with this man called Pontius Pilate, a governor in the Roman Empire who rules over the Jews. We're also going to see in an indirect way how Jesus encounters the Jewish leaders during this final trial before he goes to his death. So we're going to study this passage under three headings. First, we're going to look at what Jesus' kingdom does not oppose. Then we're going to see what his kingdom does actually oppose. And then finally, we're going to see what Jesus' kingdom offers. So what Jesus' kingdom does not oppose, what it does oppose, and finally, what it offers. So let's look at this first one together. Now, in some ways, Pontius Pilate, he represents the modern man, and he thinks and asks questions like many of us. For example, that famous question, what is truth? He also represents us in the way where he has this framework, a framework that sees religion and government as, as if they're these two opposing institutions, church versus the state. And we can see that's his ultimate concern because underneath his questioning of Jesus is him investigating if Jesus is truly a threat to the Roman government. Now, during this time, the Jews were living under the Roman Empire, and while they were allowed this limited form of autonomy, they were always kept in check to ensure that they would never rise up and revolt against the Romans, although they were unsex un unsuccessful, because that's, uh, that's the reality of history. The Jews did revolt and rebel against them many times. So that's the crux of Pilate's questioning. If you look with me, verse 33, Pilate calls Jesus and he asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? And while I have you there, look down to verse 37. 
He questions again. Pilate says to him, so are you a king? And so he's simply asking, are you someone trying to unite the Jewish people to oppose and overthrow the Roman government? And that question reveals how and how he uh, represents modern man, how us, how we, how many of us have this notion that God's kingdom directly opposes earthly ones, our world, our nations, and our governments. And Jesus challenges this notion in the way he answers Pilate. Jesus, in fact, doesn't respond with an answer, but rather with a question. Why? Because to answer Pilate according to his question would mean that Jesus is operating under the same framework, this false notion that the Roman kingdom and God's kingdom are on the same level and they are directly opposing each other. See how Jesus responds with this question in verse 34. Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? For Jesus to respond yes or no means that Jesus' kingdom is at the same level of earthly kingdoms and therefore in direct opposition to the Roman Empire, but he doesn't do so. And instead, he further explains in verse 36, No. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. He's saying my kingdom doesn't subsist under your kingdom. It's not in your kingdom. It's not under your kingdom. He's saying my kingdom doesn't stand in direct opposition to your kingdom, nor is my kingdom irre irrelevant. It's not as if my kingdom is outside of this world either. But what he is saying is my kingdom is completely other. It operates on a completely different realm. My kingdom is not of this world. Not in, not under, not out of this world, but not of this world. And we too, we tend to think that Jesus operates at this same level, struggling to fight against these earthly entities and forces that are in this world, you know, fighting against the, the earthly governments or, or big corporations and, and wicked leaders. Or even in our personal lives, we think that Jesus is struggling some, in some way to fight against the, these things in our lives as if he's on equal ground with them. We think, for, for example, that Jesus is simply out to, to take things away out of our lives. Or perhaps to simply just add more Christian things or Christian-related things into our lives. We have this false notion that the deeper you are in Jesus' kingdom, there is simply more do's and don'ts. You know, less Netflix, more Bible reading, less earning money and more giving away money, or, or less exposing your children to the sobering reality of, realities of the world, and more Christian programs and activities and camps. Even outside of our homes, we may think in this either-or fashion. We need less secular influences in this world, and we need more Christian ones. We need more Christian schools, more Christian leaders, and more Christian uh, initiatives and programs. But we're reminded that Christianity does not operate in the same realm as the earthly. Jesus says to Pilate, If my kingdom operated in the same realm as your kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, then my fi uh, followers would have been fighting against yours, but they're not. Because my kingdom does not stand in direct opposition to yours. It's in a completely different category, and it's one that's personal. It's a kingdom that's concerned with where you're going to spend the rest of eternity. It's a kingdom that can't be seen. It can't be physically entered. And we saw that in Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic power of darkness and the spiritual forces of evil. It's a kingdom where you can't force people to serve you. Not with physical or political pressure. It's a kingdom that changes the heart first. And then in turn, people's lives are changed. 
You see, Jesus' kingdom is not out to simply get you to watch less TV, (laughs) but to change your heart, to glorify God with both your time of work and rest. It's not simply after you just reading more scripture, but changing your heart to believe that what you read is God's voice speaking to you with a personal message for you and in your situation. It's transforming not simply what you do with money, but how you view money and how you see it as as being stewards of God's possessions and how it can be used to bless and love others. Jesus' kingdom is not simply adding more Christian influences and programs into the world to, to fight against secular ones, but it instills people a message of hope as they live in this world as teachers, as politicians and scientists, yet they operate on a completely different level when they face struggle and challenges and what ultimately motivates them to serve society. Christianity is deeply personal. And so when Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers with a deeply personal question back to Pilate. Are you saying this about me? Or is this simply what other people are saying? He's asking him, am I your king? And you can see the two different realities taking place in our passage. In Pilate's world, Jesus is on trial. He's being questioned. But in the reality of his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, Pilate is on trial. He's being questioned with a question that you and I must ask ourselves, the most important question of our lives. Jesus asking, am I your king? Or is that what others say about me? Jesus' kingdom is deeply personal, and only when it is, it will radically transform our hearts, which in turn will change lives, starting with yours and then to others. Let me illustrate it this way. You can teach a child all throughout his upbringing the importance of kindness and generosity. You can remind him each time when he's being selfish to to share with others. Or you can rebuke him every time he starts to develop this ugly tendency of, of entitlement over others. But with those external pressures alone, the teaching and all the rebuking can never guarantee that the child will grow up to be a generous and kind person. But have him see how an act of generosity changes the face of a person who receives it. Have him see how his love and how his warmth can genuinely touch others. And have him see how they now in turn shows the same kind of love and kindness to others. Have him see that. Have him see how his act of kindness can change other people's lives and have him see this attractiveness of generosity. And then it will become personal. And then it will transform his life. You know, one unfortunate, uh, one unfortunate common sight you see in South Korea, where I was this past summer, is as you walk along the streets, you see many elderly people at times selling sticks of gum. They just lay out a piece, a piece of cloth and they're sitting there trying to make some money. And, and to be honest, these sticks of gum They're very overpriced. They're more than double the price of what you would have to uh, spend in a convenience store. And they know that, and the people know that. And for me personally, it's very hard to just just walk past these elderly people, especially uh, when you compare them to, you know, perhaps people in their 20s uh, asking for money. I know I shouldn't have biases, but the more that I think about it, the reason why my heart goes out to these elderly people It's because every time I see a grandmom selling pieces of gum on the street, I can't help but see my own grandmother and see my own grandfather. And I can't help but think of the kind uh, love and generosity that they've given me and that I personally received from them. And I know it doesn't make sense to think that, that my act of love towards these grandparents on the street 
somehow benefits my own grandparents, but at the same time, any act of generosity is done because my heart's been transformed, because it's deeply personal to me. Martin Luther once said, the heart of Christianity lies in its personal pronouns. God says, I will be your God. You will be my people. If you're looking at your life and you're wondering, why isn't anything different? I've been praying, I've been doing this, I've been reading scripture, going to church. Perhaps Jesus wants you to slow down, especially during this COVID time, to ask you this question, hold on, am I your king? Unlike any earthly power, you can never force the gospel into someone's heart. You can never pressure someone into Christianity, and Christianity will not change anyone's actions unless it first radically transforms your heart. And one of the foundational truths of the gospel is that our ability to love others is first anchored upon seeing how much Christ loves you. Our ability to forgive others, even our enemies, is dependent not on our enemy's remorse or them pleading for forgiveness, but as Ephesians chapter 4 says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in heaven forgave you. Not according to them. So we see that's not what Jesus' kingdom Oppose. It's not opposing earthly kingdoms. Our second point, we're going to now see what his kingdom does actually oppose. As we're reminded, Jesus' kingdom is not on the same plane as the earthly ones. But that's not to say that God's kingdom is simply out there somewhere and, and unconcerned with our lives. It is concerned with us, and we see that by what it does oppose. It opposes the kingdom of self. It opposes our love and concern for ourselves more than God and others. It opposes this idolatry of ourselves. And because of that, his kingdom doesn't against, go against one's allegiance to the Roman Empire, but Pilate's allegiance to himself. It goes against all the self-concerns and self-idolatries of these Jewish leaders, and this is, in fact, additional proof that, that Jesus' kingdom is not simply to oppose one empire, but to oppose the sin and idolatry that exists in all people, Rome or Jewish, for those who belong to the Roman Empire or Israel or United States, no matter what earthly kingdom you reside in. So here's what we'll do. Let's look at the Jewish leaders, and we'll go back to Pilate once again. And to understand with what's going on with these Jewish leaders, we have to investigate their ultimate motives behind their actions. And to do that, you need to look for a pattern of behavior through more than one instance. And only after multiple observations, then you can formulate some conclusions regarding their underlying motives and their issues. And that's the case when you examine everyone, right? You can't just isolate one act or one behavior but you need to observe them to see how they act in a multiple uh, array of situations. For example, let me illustrate it this way. Um, some of my friends, they know that I hate pickles. All kinds, dill, kosher, jerkin, all of them. Gherkin. Now, someone may know that about me by simply being a casual friend. And I'll call them you know, tier three level friends. Now, a tier two friend may also know that I don't like mayonnaise. Perhaps they'll also know that I don't use any kind of salad dressing. Perhaps even some of them know that I don't like kimchi, which is a Korean fermented pickled cabbage. So those are my tier three and tier two friends, and they can make these observations about me. But to be a tier one friend, it makes more than just observing one instance of me taking the pickles out of my sandwich or, or eating a plain salad and all of its raw freshness. In order to be a tier one friend, you can't simply think, oh, Luke doesn't like pickles. He doesn't like salad dressing or kimchi. A level one friend deeply ponders about me and contemplates all that's underneath my preferences and eventually finds out that underneath it all, my underlying motive, my heart issue is not pickles or salad dressing, 
but it's vinegar. I ultimately hate vinegar, and that is the common ingredient in all of these things, hence all kinds of fermentation I dislike. But you can only deduce that if you examine the pattern of behaviors in all of my eating habits and take that time to to contemplate deeply. And so if you do that with the Jewish leaders, we see a pattern. At first, it seems like their allegiance is to Caesar. And they're trying to use that to pressure Pilate to kill Jesus. So when they first bring Jesus to Caesar, and we see this in verse 30, in Luke's account, they say, Jesus is trying to make himself king, meaning he's opposing Caesar. Now, when Pilate investigates and sees no guilt in Jesus, in chapter 19, verse 7, he says this, there is no guilt in this man. In fact, according to the law, to your law, uh, I'll give you another person in his place. And now what do the Jewish leaders say in verse 7? He says, we have a law, and according to that law, Jesus ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Look how quickly the Jewish leaders changed their allegiance from Caesar back to God and the law now. It's not because of Caesar anymore. Now it's because Jesus claims to be son of God. So now there's a religious reason why he should die. And as as that wasn't enough, they go back to Caesar later on. They declare their allegiance back to Caesar because when Pilate says, you know, no, I'm going to release him, the Jews cry out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Do you see the hypocrisy here? Going from Caesar first, back to God and the law, and then back to Caesar. It's like hating pickles and the mayonnaise and then kimchi. What's the underlying motive here? It's not God. It's not Caesar. It's themselves. Their ultimate goal is to remove Jesus because he threatens their standing and their position as religious leaders amongst the Jewish people. That's the common thread. They had a problem because more and more people started following Jesus and and away from them. Now, they couldn't kill Jesus because if they did, then all the people would be angry at them. So they're trying to make Pilate to do their dirty work. They're not looking to Pilate to be a fair judge. If you remember, they actually had their own trial in the Sanhedrin in the previous chapter. They're just simply using whatever reason they could come up with to get Pilate to carry out their sentence of killing Jesus from using Caesar's name misusing God's name and the law, all to preserve their standing in their religious community. It's not God, it's not Caesar, it's themselves. Now, when we look back again to Pilate, he's no different. What's underneath his heart? What's his motive? And you can get a glimpse of it as he talks to Jesus. He says things like, don't you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you, Jesus? But let's look a little bit more into his background. Pilate, he became the governor of this land, Judea, only a few years before our passage. Now, Judea, where where the Jews resided, uh, they were notorious amongst the Roman Empire. It was the least desirable outpost in Rome for Roman governors because the Jews were known to be hostile towards Roman rule. They rebelled and revolted many times, and they continued to do so even after Jesus' death. And so when Pilate came to Jerusalem, he first set up these images of the emperor, and that infuriated the Jews. And they fought back. Uh, They did a sit-down strike for five days straight. And Pilate, in response to that, he called in the troops and he threatened to, uh, to behead them. And with that threat, the Jews actually stretched out their necks. And seeing that Pilate eventually gave in, and word got back to Caesar in Rome, Pilate's boss. Pilate did all these other things. He used funds from the Jewish temple. He brought in other sacrilegious items, and the Jews fought back and revolted, and word got back to Rome again and again. So you can see, by this time, Pilate's suffering from job insecurity. He knows that Caesar, back at home, keeps hearing reports about how Pilate is not able to assert his authority over the Jewish people. So if he can't stifle another potential revolt, that this might be the last straw for him. And see, that's why Pilate keeps asking Jesus, are you a threat to the Roman Empire? Why to see if his job's in danger? But eventually he is going to see that Jesus is innocent, 
innocent when it comes to trying to start this rebellion against Rome. So more than once, we see Pilate going back to the Jews saying, I find no guilt in him. This man is innocent. He serves no threat to this structure of power that resides in Rome. And after hearing that, what's the Jewish leader's final card? They say this, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And we see, even though Jesus is beaten and humiliated and looks nothing like a threat to Caesar, the Jews are pretty much saying, we're going to make sure that word gets back to Caesar if you release Jesus. And we're going to make sure that he knows that you release this man who calls himself a king and opposes Caesar. We're going to make your job in danger. And that reveals Pilate's ultimate heart issue when he releases Jesus in response to that. His motive to protect his spot as a Roman governor, and it's the same as the Jewish leaders, to preserve his place in authority, to preserve his power of authority over against the people. And he and the leaders swear allegiance to themselves. D.A. Carson says this, we want to be God. So we will determine who is good and who is bad. We want to be number one in our homes and in our jobs. We have to be number one or else somebody will get hurt. All of these social manifestations of evil finally go back to just one problem. Just one problem. I will be God. Jesus' kingdom doesn't stand in opposition to the Roman kingdom, nor earthly governments and nations, but it stands opposed to our self-made kingdoms where we reign as kings. Finally, what Jesus' kingdom offers. We saw what it doesn't oppose and what it does oppose. Let's see what it offers. And I want to draw out two things. The first, it offers a sovereign purpose in all that you do. It offers you a purpose and hope as you engage in the world, not retreat from it. In fact, it gives you a radically different outlook on how you are to view your work, your relationships, and whatever good you're attempting to do. Because Jesus never encouraged uh, his followers to, to disengage from the world. Rather, he sends them into the world. But he does so by giving them a purpose and a hope a hope that can always qualify the work that they're doing. Even Jesus himself in our passage, he didn't seek to avoid the trial that was before him. Rather, he clung on to the purposes of the kingdom while he's in trial. His purpose is made clear. Even in the questioning, Jesus says, for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world. And what's that purpose? To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Even in the face of deep persecution and suffering, the purposes of Jesus' kingdom never wavers. And likewise, for whatever you set your plow to, whatever work you have in front of you, even in the face of suffering and persecution, even when in the world's eyes there is no value to what you are doing, whether it be because of the lack of success or the lack of prestige it brings to the eyes of the world, you know that you are serving a purpose in the kingdom that will always stand, the purpose of pleasing your king. And equipped with that kind of purpose, equips you to engage the world, but never to be brought to despair, regardless of whatever it throws at you. Most of us know Samuel Morse, and he's the man who invented the telegraph, and the transmission of this Morse code. Now, the trajectory of his life that led him to invent this is pretty amazing because he was initially a struggling painter, barely making ends meet. And he was a widower too, his wife dying within years of his parents. And it was on his voyage back home from the funeral that he met an inventor, one who got him interested in this idea of sending electronic impulses through wires. And it's been 20 years ever since he uh, heard that, uh, where he first sent the first uh, telegraph message. There's an account where once he was seen uh, bowed over the desk that he was working at, 
And they asked him, what are you doing? He was asked, and he replied, I'm asking God for help. Every time I go into the laboratory, I say, oh God, I am nothing. Give me wisdom. Give me clarity of mind. And so it's not surprising that the very first telegraph message he sends were these words, what has God wrought? And he explained what he meant by that message, and he said it means it is God's work. He shared that he was quoting Psalm 115, not unto us, but to thy name, O Lord, be all the praise. Whether it be the failures of his paintings, the grease that piled upon his life, or the monotonous number of hours spent in the laboratory. Morse had a kingdom purpose in this world, the purpose of God's glory. That's what the kingdom offers us. And secondly, what does it offer? It offers you a rejected, unattractive king. Pilate orders Jesus to be beaten and humiliated. And we see in chapter 19, starting with verse 2, that the soldiers twist a crown of thorns and put it on his head and array him with a purple robe. And now these thorns, they weren't these small thorns that come out of these vines or anything like that. There are these long spikes that came from date palms. They could be even up to 12 inches long. And the reason why they're long is because they serve to, to mockingly imitate the radiance that king emit from themselves. So he was spit upon. He was beaten. He was clothed with a cloak, probably from one of the soldiers, to imitate the robes of a king. And in the other gospel accounts, he was given a reed to hold to represent this scepter. And the soldiers bowed before him, ridiculing, crying, Hail, King of the Jews! And that's how Pilate presents Jesus. Why? All to show the Jewish leaders, see, this is the one who claims himself to be king. He's no threat to you or me. Look at him. He has no power. He is embarrassing. And the Jews refuse. Every time Pilate refers to Jesus as your king, they say, no, we have no king but Caesar. The characteristics of Jesus' kingdom is not one that fights back with flesh and blood. It's not one where Jesus brings down legions of angels to obliterate all those who oppose him or rouse up his uh, disciples to revolt against the empire. The characteristics of his kingdom that we see in Jesus' response is one of grace, humility, and suffering. The soldiers and the Jews thought it was ironic to see a king beaten and humiliated. But to those in his kingdom, it is anything but ironic. It is representative of what Jesus does for those in his kingdom. It's not one of physical power and protection, but one of self-offering for the sins of mankind. Charles Spurgeon says this about Jesus. When you look at him, you're struck. Struck at once with the thought that if he be a king, he is like no other monarch. For other kings, they're clothed with rich apparel and surrounded with pomp, but he has none of these. Their glories usually consist in wars in which they made others suffer, but his glory is his own suffering. No blood but his own has flowed to make him illustrious. And likewise, he says, Christianity, in all of its outward appearances, is equally unattractive. It's amongst the base things of this world and the things which are not. And God has chosen that to be his own. And that's what Jesus' kingdom offers us, a sovereign purpose and an unattractive king. But the beauty of the gospel is presented when we see how these two things come together. Because it's precisely in all that Jesus endures in our passage and in the cross that the sovereign purposes of God become realized. No force of evil can stop it. And in fact, whatever evil does to, to try to stop Christ, it actually fulfills God's sovereign purpose of redemption in this unattractive king. Because if you think with me, the Jewish leaders, they could have stoned Jesus and killed him on their own, but instead they seek Pilate to crucify him. Why? Because in their minds, they want to hang him on a tree. 
They want him to be a curse. And they know in Deuteronomy 21, it says whoever dies hanging from a tree is cursed. And that's why they want Jesus to hang from that tree because they want all the people to see that Jesus is cursed. But even in the way they try to crucify him, it predicts what Jesus said about himself, that this is how he's going to die. Pilate wanted to protect his position as Roman governor. He went against his own conclusions regarding Jesus' innocence, gave in to the Jews all to protect his job, and he crucifies Jesus. Why? With the intent of self-preservation. And all of that served the sovereign purposes of God where the Savior of the world would be afflicted and pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, oppressed yet he opened not his mouth. Why? So that by his wounds, we would be healed. Healed from our sins, freed from our addictions to serve only ourselves, and empowered to live for a purpose that can never be thwarted, whatever kingdom of this world may challenge us with. So brothers and sisters, at first glance, it may seem like Jesus is on trial, but we need to see that you and I, we are on trial before King Jesus, the Lord of Lords. And on this trial, Pilate presents Jesus as a beaten and broken man, humiliated. And like in our passage, he says, here is the man. Here is the man that claims to be your king. Here is the man that came into the world to die for your sins. Here's the man who came to free you from yourself and to give you the eternal riches of glory. See from his hands, his head and feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? Here's the man, Jesus Christ. The one who came into this world not to establish Christian governments and oppose secular ones or to simply add more Christian things into your life and less secular ones, but here is the man who died for your sins. This is what he looks like. Unattractive in the eyes of the world. Is this man your king? And if he is, then we too may look unattractive to the eyes of the world as we follow his path of grace, humility, and self-offering. But we will never lose hope, knowing that all we do is in response to Jesus, who himself walked that path of grace and self-offering to free us from the kingdom of ourselves. Let us pray. As we end our time, I believe it's fitting for all of us to take a few seconds and answer this question, is Jesus your king? And are there any other kingdoms that you've been holding on to, especially the kingdom of self? where you reign. Take a second to examine the words that you have spoken this week, the thoughts that you have had, what your life looks like. Does it look like you're serving yourself or serving the king? Be free, free from yourself to serve a king who died for you. Let us take a few seconds and pray that. Heavenly Father, forgive us for trying to constrain you into our lives, into our desires, our expectations of what we want from you. We pray that you will never be to us simply a man, but the King of Kings. We thank you that you died to save us from this idolatry of ourselves, where everything, everything we want simply serves our desires, but you transform our hearts so that we can serve you as our king as we go out into this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us respond to God's word with a song of praise.
must now receive the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ enable us to look up to him as king, not simply today, but tomorrow and every moment of our lives in suffering, persecution, and even the day-to-day things that we face. And may the love of God the Father strengthen us to remind us that we are not alone, but we have a personal God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit give us endurance as we hold on to this gospel message of hope for us and to those who deeply need it. May this love, this grace, this strength be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in his peace.